What up, YouTube? Here with another episode of Talk Wrestling. On this episode, I'll be giving y'all my review on the latest pay-per-view events in pro wrestling. First review I'll be giving y'all my review on is AEW Full Gear. And then after that, I'll be giving y'all my review on Survivor Series. Now, without any further ado, let's get to the reviewing part. The opening contest to this year's Full Gear was a six-man tag team match with Adam Copeland teaming with Sting and Darby Allin taking on the team of Christian Cage and Nick Wayne and Luchasaurus. And Sting, Darby Allin, and Adam Copeland had Ric Flair accompanying them. As y'all know, Sting is scheduled to retire next year at Revolution and... Ric Flair is a part of that retirement tour. And I don't know how the contractual situation is looking with Ric Flair and AEW. And from what I heard, it was featured on ESPN. From what I saw, Ric Flair is supposed to make more frequent appearances with AEW. And... That goes to show you how Ric Flair's whole life is based on pro wrestling. <laughs> Regardless of the fact that his daughter is with WWE and him being a two-time Hall of Famer over there. Do y'all remember when Ric Flair had his uh, retirement match versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 24? When he lost to Shawn Michaels, he was supposed to retire and then like a year or two later... He goes on to TNA, and then now, since WWE doesn't have anything for Ric Flair, Ric Flair goes off to AEW. However, it does make sense that Ric Flair is there because he helped most Sting's pro wrestling career together from when Sting started his pro wrestling career at WCW. So I think it's only right that Ric Flair is a part of this last run that Sting is going on before he retires at the spring of next year. And the opening contest, it, it was a good one. And I like how they had Adam Copeland and Christian Cage not engage in any physical altercation because from what I saw, it looks like they're building Adam Copeland to challenge for the TNT title, which is held by Christian Cage. And as y'all know, they are childhood friends. And Adam Copeland, and I'm sure Christian Cage had a lot to do with Adam Copeland signing with AEW once, he, once his contract expired with the WWE and they couldn't come to terms to have Adam Copeland re-sign with the WWE with Christian Cage, as I said, being a childhood friend of Adam Copeland. And Adam Copeland immediately joined AEW after him and the WWE couldn't come to an agreement for Adam Copeland to continue working there. And they're building it up really well because during this match, we saw Christian Cage attempt to hit Adam Copeland with his TNT title. However, Adam Copeland will move out of the way and Christian Cage will accidentally strike Luchasaurus with the TNT title. And then Adam Copeland gave that fiery look towards Christian Cage for trying to hit his longtime best friend with his TNT title. And Adam Copeland chased Christian Cage out of the arena, leaving Luchasaurus to take the fall for his team. And Adam Copeland hit the spear on Luchasaurus. And then Darby Allin hit the coffin drop to secure the win for their team. And I will give this match a rating of a 3 out of a 5. And I like how they played off this fact. Y'all remember when Randy Orton was back on his legend killer role back in 2020. And Randy Orton had Ric Flair accompanying him for that run for a short while. And Christian, who was a part of that feud with Edge, a.k.a. Adam Copeland, and Randy Orton, 
Ric Flair when he was accompanying Randy Orton for his match versus Christian Cage. Ric Flair hit Christian Cage with the low blow. And during this match, when Christian Cage had a physical altercation ringside with Ric Flair, he would hit a dirty move on the so-called dirtiest player in the game with a eye poke and a low blow, which is what Ric Flair hit Christian Cage with three years ago. I thought that was a funny play from AEW and their bookers during this match. And then the next match at full gear, we saw for the international title, John Moxley versus Orange Cassidy. Now, this was a hard-hitting, very physically brutal match. Y'all remember their match at All Out? It was the main event of All Out, and it was somewhat like that. And they continued from where they left off at from All Out. And Orange Cassidy got the win, successfully defending his AEW international title. Now, they've done a good job at neutralizing John Moxley and his character because John Moxley, if y'all remember at the beginning of AEW, the whole company was pretty much based on John Moxley and his invincibility. They made him look like the Roman Reigns of AEW with him barely ever taking a loss. And this helps Orange Cassidy build his legitimacy, getting a victory over on John Moxley the way he did. And him hanging in there with John Moxley and going blow for blow with John Moxley makes Orange Cassidy look like gold. And for Orange Cassidy to get this win the way he did versus John Moxley, it was an emphatic fashion of a win that Orange Cassidy scored over on John Moxley. And John Moxley, he always bleeds. That's why it's not that much of a big deal when John Moxley blades. And John Moxley, the way he lost, when he ran towards Orange Cassidy, he ran head first to the exposed turnbuckle. And then Orange Cassidy will follow that up with four Superman punches. And then he would hit the Slumlord Billionaire. I think that's what his other finishing move is called. Anyways, I think it's called... Yeah, that, 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 that's what I think is um, called. Anyways, that's how Orange Cassidy got the win over on John Moxley to successfully defend his international title. And Orange Cassidy, before he regained his AEW international title, he made that title look really good because of how frequently he defended that international title. And from what I heard, he's picking up where he left off at from his previous run. And that title is synonymous with Orange Cassidy. And I'll give this match a rating of a three and a half out of a five. And then the next match on the card, we saw a four-way ladder match for the AEW Tag Team titles with Ricky Starks and Big Bill taking on FTR and um, the Incarnacion with the team of Roosh and Dralistico. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I'm not a native Spanish speaker. Now, and then the fourth team that was a participant for this four-way tag team ladder match for the tag titles was the Kings of the Black Throne, the team of Malachi Black and Brody King. And a cool factor that was displayed during this match was the physical altercation with Brody King and Big Bill, the two of the biggest men physically stature wise speaking going back and forth throughout this match and a ladder match has that hardcore element to it and i thought that was displayed with the highlight reel spots that was featured during this four-way ladder match 
for the tag titles. And the team of Ricky Starks and Big Bill got the win to retain the AEW tag team titles. And as I said, a ladder match is one of the most fun gimmicked matches that is from pro wrestling. And as I said, it would take me all day to go over all the highlight reel spots that was featured throughout this match. I would highly recommend for y'all to go check out the entirety of that match. If not, then go check out the clips from this match at AEW Full Gear, this four-way ladder match for the tag team titles. And I'll give this match a rating of a four out of a five. That's how good this match was for the AEW tag team titles. And I've been a critic of AEW when it comes to them and how they produce multi wrestler being featured in one match and how it's discombobulated and it's disorganized and how they don't do a good job at spreading the time slots for each wrestlers to have their shining moments at matches like this. However, this match was very well put together and that's why I give this match a rating of a 4 out of a 5. Now, if AEW continues to put on matches like this whenever they have a multi-wrestler feature matches, now that would be a good look for AEW. And we'll see as AEW continues to grow as a wrestling franchise. And then the next match on the card was for the AEW Women's title. Tony Storm taking on Hikaru Shida. Now, I haven't been keeping up with the weekly episodes with AEW and none of their shows. I didn't know Soraya lost the AEW Women's title to Hikaru Shida. And I was surprised that Soraya dropped the title to Hikaru Shida on a random episode of AEW, whether it had been Dynamite, Rampage, or Collision. And Tony Storm was in the midst of a feud with her former team members, Soraya and Ruby Soho. That's why I thought it would have been appropriate storyline-wise for Tony Storm to take the title from Soraya and I don't know what is going on with AEW and all their storylines. I know what's going on as far as the main storylines that AEW's got going on right now. And come to find out, that ain't really matter because Tony Storm got the win and became the new AEW Women's Champion after defeating Hikaru Shida. And this is a refreshing look for Tony Storm because she got this new psychotic character that she's playing and that was a revamp or that is a revamp to speak more correctly to make more sense wise because I don't want to stumble across my words. And with that being said, Tony Storm, I'm looking forward to her being the new AEW Women's Champion with this new character that she got right now. And Hikaru Shida, I thought she was a transitional champion for Tony Storm to pick up this win and become yet again the new AEW Women's Champion. And then I will give this match a rating of a 2 out of a 5. It was a mediocre match. I thought... This match, as far as match quality was, could have been on a dynamite or a collision. And the next match on the card we saw was a Texas death match with 
Hangman Adam Page taking on Swerve Strickland. Now, this match is a match where Hangman Adam Page specializes in. And this match was as brutal as it came. And I like how they built the animosity amongst these two wrestlers. And I thought it was very appropriate that this match and this rivalry came to an end the way it did in a Texas death match because of how much zealousness that both Adam Page and Swerve Strickland had for one another, starting from Wrestle Dream, because y'all remember Swerve Strickland picked up the win in a very controversial matter, and because of the way Swerve Strickland won that match at Wrestle Dream, it was only right that a Texas death match came from this rivalry between these two wrestlers at full gear. And this match, as I said, was brutal. It fit the gimmick of the Texas death match. And I would recommend, if y'all haven't seen the full match, then I would suggest that y'all go check it out. Because it would take me a long time to go over all the hardcore highlight reel spots that was featured throughout this match. And there was a whole bunch of them. And that's why I'm just going to tell y'all the ending to this match. We saw Swerve Strickland's fellow embassy member, Brian Cage, step in on the behalf of Swerve Strickland, as well as Prince Nana, the manager of the embassy, also making an interference on the behalf of Swerve Strickland when Swerve Strickland was in trouble. And Hangman Adam Page would take out both Nana and Brian Cage, and then that would leave room for Swerve Strickland to sneak in there and to have Hangman Adam Page hung from the post with a steel chain. Y'all remember the Texas death match that we saw last year with Hangman Adam Page and John Moxley? How Hangman Adam Page had John Moxley hung with that steel chain from the top rope to the apron of the ring? That's how Swerve Strickland got the win over on Heyman Adam Page at full gear. Unlike how John Moxley was hanging from the apron of the ring from the top rope, it was on the outside and Swerve Strickland was hanging Heyman Adam Page from the steel post. And Swerve Strickland... If that win over on Heyman Adam Page at Wrestle Dream wasn't enough, him getting a win over on Heyman Adam Page in a match where Heyman Adam Page specializes in, furthermore cements and legitimizes Swerve Strickland's push as a legitimate singles competitor in AEW. This could definitely have Swerve Strickland stamped as a future potential world champion and I'll give this match a rating of a 4 out of a 5 then the next match on the card we saw the Golden Jets the team of Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega take on the Young Bucks now from what I saw it looks like the Young Bucks are heel again and this match makes sense because the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega are longtime buddies. They were a part of the same group called the Elite, and they're both executive presidents to AEW. They helped find this company, AEW, from the start of it, and I didn't know that Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho was going to formulate a team together 
after they teamed up with one another to take on the Don Callis family, who is a common enemy to both Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega, and to feud with the Young Bucks, who are friends with Kenny Omega. I like how that intertwines with each other. And the match itself, it was... It was alright, could have been better. It felt more like a time filler match than it was more of a legitimate match. And I know that these four wrestlers could have produced a better match with the ability that all these wrestlers possess. However, I don't have any complaints that came out of this match. And... For Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega to get a win over on the Young Bucks, who've been a tag team ever since they became pro wrestlers, is a good look for this newly formed team of Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega. It It legitimizes Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho as a team who are already accomplished singles competitors and for them to get a win over the Young Bucks as a tag team definitely catapults them to possibly challenge for the AEW tag titles in the future and I'll give this match a rating of a 3 out of a 5 now I don't know if they're going to continue this feud with the Golden Jets and the Young Bucks, they definitely can. And storyline-wise, as I said, it will make sense for them to continue this feud. And I wouldn't mind it because I'm sure they can produce a better match than what we saw at Full Gear. And I don't know how long this team of Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega is going to continue before they go their own ways as singles competitors. And I'm sure the Young Bucks would like to climb up to the ranks of the tag team division in AEW to yet again become the tag team champions and be at the top of the AEW Tag Team Division once again. Then the next match on the card we saw was a three-way match for the TBS title. Chris Statlander taking on Blue Scott and Julia Hart. And this match was a decent match. I'll give this match a rating of a 3 out of a 5. I like how these three young women who are on the come-up as well they are already legitimate female wrestlers however them getting a pay-per-view match makes them more of a legit wrestler than they already are and them getting this kind of spotlight definitely helps them get noticed by the wrestling fans And Julia Hart got the win, becoming the new AEW TBS champion. And Julia Hart, who's been the manager for the House of Black. And before that, she was the manager for um, Brian Pillman Jr. And I forgot who he was teaming with. Was it Brian Pillman Jr. and Brock Anderson? I don't know. It was... It was a jobber team that she was managing for before she became the manager for the House of Black. And she's been getting a real fast, steady push as a singles competitor. And her getting this win at full gear and becoming the new TBS champion has definitely stamped her as a legit female wrestler and putting a title on her legitimizes and further pushes her current push that she got going on right now. And the way how Julia Hart won this match was 
I would say very smart and intelligent way how she had won this match because Chris Statlander had Blue Sky rolled up to what it looked like was going to be yet another successful defense of her TBS title. Then Julia Hart came out of nowhere and knocked Chris Statlander out of the way to pick up the scraps of Chris Statlander to get the win over on Blue Sky by pinning her to become the new TBS champion. And this is a good look for Julia Hart with this current push that she got going on right now and putting the TBS title on her further pushes her current push. And the next match on the card we saw was the main event. And I didn't know that MJF was gimmickly injured because Adam Cole came out who's already injured and came out on crutches to replace MJF to defend the AEW world title in the honor of his friend versus Jay White. And MJF came out of nowhere from the ambulance and that is a dramatic entrance for MJF. I don't know if it was MJF that got attacked backstage prior to this match by the Bullet Club. And that's why MJF was rushed to the emergency and he couldn't come out to defend his AEW world title versus Jay White. And that's why Adam Cole had to make the entrance prior to this match becoming official to take the spot for MJF for the AEW world title. But MJF came out to derail the plan that Jay White and Bullet Club had to get the win over on either MJF or Adam Cole for Jay White to get the AEW world title at full gear. And regardless of the fact that MJF had a leg injury, he still got the win over on Jay White in a classic MJF fashion. When he would hit Jay White with a low blow. And then Adam Cole who passed the ring of MJF off to MJF for MJF to retrieve it. And hit Jay White after hitting Jay White with the low blow. With that punch of his with the ring wrapped around his pinky to get the win to successfully defend and retain his AEW world title and the match itself it was decent and the way how this match ended was appropriate to close out the show however the match quality itself could have been better it was more of a storytelling match based on the rivalry of MJF and Jay White and I will give this match a rating of a 3 out of a 5. And I'm sure that this match could have been better if MJF didn't have a gimmick injury for this match versus Jay White. Now, because of the way MJF won, I'm quite sure that they're going to continue this feud with MJF and Jay White and I will give this full gear show a rating of a 7 out of a 10. Now moving on. I will be giving y'all my review on the WWE's latest pay-per-view event that being Survivor Series that happened this past Saturday. And the opening contest of this year's Survivor Series was the War Games match featuring the woman. And I thought that was the appropriate move that the WWE made on a booking part of things. 
And that's because Survivor Series, now their event is based on war games. And to have war games being the opening contest to kick off Survivor Series sets not only the tone for the rest of the show, however, it shines a spotlight on the gimmick match that the event is based on. And this match was a good one. And I'll give this match a rating of a 4 out of a 5. That goes to tell y'all how good this match was. If y'all haven't seen this match, I would definitely highly suggest for y'all to go check it out. And this women's war games match featured damage control taking on the team of Bianca Belair, Shotzi, Charlotte Flair, and Becky Lynch. And Team Bianca Belair got the win after Becky Lynch hit the rock bottom through the table on Bailey to get the win for the team of Bianca Belair, Shotzi, Charlotte Flair, and Becky Lynch. And Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch got a history of not liking each other. They are called the four horsewomen of the WWE who helped revitalize women's wrestling in the WWE. That also features Bayley as well, who's a part of the four horsewomen, and as well as Sasha Banks, who is no longer a part of the WWE. And three out of those four horsewomen were featured in this match. And I like how they played off that factor in this match with Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch displaying the animosity that they had for one another prior to this match and as well as displaying it throughout this match. However, they got along and went on a hot streak together coexisting for the sake of their team Throughout this match, working together, teaming together to let go of the fiery passion that they have for one another and taking that out on their opponents throughout this match. I thought that was a really cool moment that was featured throughout this match. And the highlight row spots that was the most highlight row moment in this match was when it was two of them actually first when EO Sky dived off the top of the cage with the garbage can covering over her and for her to do that without seeing because there's no holes on that garbage can for EO Sky to see was a amazing impressive look when she dived off the top of the cage onto the rest of the participants in this match. And as well as Charlotte Flair later on following that up with her doing a moonsault onto the rest of the participants in this match from the top of the cage. And a clever spot that was featured in this match was when Bianca Belair hit the fire extinguisher over on Asuka when she failed to hit, I think it was Shotzi with the mist that she likes to spit out on all her opponents. And I know that had to feel good for Bianca Belair because Asuka, when she was trying to get the woman's title, matter of fact, she did get the woman's title by defeating Bianca Belair with the help of the Mist. And Bianca Belair has been a victim of getting that fiery Mist spat on her by Asuka. And her hitting Asuka after she failed to hit Shotzi with that fiery Mist and Shotzi could thank her speedy, 
fast reflexes to get out of the way of getting hit with Asuka's fiery mist that she likes to spit out on her opponents. Then Bianca Belair following that up by hitting Asuka with the fire extinguisher to have Asuka get a taste of her own medicine. I thought that was a clever, funny booking on the part of the WWE creative and the producers that helped put this match together and orchestrate it. And as I said, that was a real good opening contest to kick off this year's Survivor Series. Then next, we saw the Intercontinental title match with Gunther defending his Intercontinental title versus The Miz. And Gunther could add yet another name to his impressive resume that is building. And he can add a legend like The Miz onto that list. After he got a win over on the Miz to successfully defend the Intercontinental title. And this goes to show y'all the Miz's versatility of being able to fluctuate from playing a heel character and playing a babyface character. And he does do a good job at playing either or. And this happened on an episode of Monday Night Raw when The Miz had Gunther featured on Miz TV and Gunther trash-talked and downplayed The Miz's ability and his legacy and his legitimacy. That's what kicked off this rivalry. Miz being a two-time Grand Slam champion and a decorated Intercontinental champion and him being featured in an Intercontinental title match to hopefully become Intercontinental Champion and to fight for the Intercontinental title, being on the scene for the Intercontinental title is a good look for the Intercontinental title and his prestigious. And Gunther got the win in a fashion where Gunther doesn't often get a win in this matter. And he got the win after hitting the walls of Jericho on the Miz to get a tap out win. And Gunther is not a submission specialist. And that's why it was a refreshing look for Gunther and to show off his ability of being versatile as a wrestler was, I would say, a good look and that is a credit that should go out to the creative and the producers that helped put this match together and Gunther I would say has improved a lot lately when it comes to his character work and that goes with his talking ability on the mic And his charisma because his wrestling ability has been top notch. And that's what his reputation is built on. And I'll give this match a rating of a three and a half out of a five. And The Miz came close at getting the getting the win over on Gunther. After having Gunther run into the exposed turnbuckle and then The Miz hitting Gunther with a low blow and then following that up with a skull crushing finale and Gunther kicked out of that and that goes to add on to Gunther's resilience and his fortitude and his and his will and his strength to keep his intercontinental title and the next match on the card we saw was Dragon Lee taking on Santos Escobar it was supposed to be Carlito taking on Santos Escobar now I don't know why Carlito was kayfaved booked out of this match versus Santos Escobar because it would have made more sense 
for Carlito to have a match versus Santos Escobar because Carlito, when he made his official return to the WWE, he came back to be a part of the LWO and Santos Escobar ditching LWO because of a dispute with him and Carlito. That's why that match was more of a pay-per-view worthy match booking-wise. However, stylistically speaking, Santos Escobar versus Dragon Lee makes for a better wrestling match than what we would have saw if Carlito were to step in there versus Santos Escobar. And Carlito is more of a notable name than a Dragon Lee. And I'm sure many wrestling fans was looking forward to Carlito having a pay-per-view match after being away from the WWE for as long as he did. And the last time Carlito had a pay-per-view match was at Unforgiven 2007 versus Triple H. And that is, what, over a decade since Carlito had a pay-per-view match. And storyline-wise speaking... This was definitely a pay-per-view worthy match we would have got to see with Carlito and Santos Escobar. However, as I said, purely wrestling-wise speaking, this match was a better pure wrestling match. And I'm sure Carlito versus Santos Escobar can't make for a better match than what Dragon Lee versus Santos Escobar can produce. And from what we saw at Survivor Series with Santos Escobar and Dragon Lee, it felt more like a time filler match than a good quality of a wrestling match that we saw between these two. And I'm sure if they would have had more time available then they could have produced a better wrestling match. However, because of the time that they was given for this event, it that that's how it felt like more of a time filler of a match. Not saying that it was a bad match because this match was good quality because when you have a wrestler like Santos Escobar and Dragon Lee, we, we're, we're bound to see a good quality, high caliber of a pure wrestling match out of a wrestler like Santos Escobar and Dragon Lee. And I'll give this match a rating of a 3 out of a 5. And Santos Escobar got the win after hitting his finishing move on Dragon Lee. And Santos Escobar is definitely bound for a push as a legitimate singles competitor. And he's got the if factor when it comes to his in-ring ability and as well as his charisma, which he's been able to show off as of lately. And his talking ability has improved for surely. And I'm sure we're going to get to see more of Santos Escobar and his ability as a mega star. And I could say... If they push him right, he's definitely going to be a, well, he's already a force to be reckoned with. And he's got a lot of steam right now with him turning heel after attacking and betraying Rey Mysterio. And him going on this rampage has definitely developed his character as a singles wrestler and if they feature him more and continue to book him this way who knows we can see Santos Escobar definitely will see Santos Escobar challenge for the world title in the future and we can see 
Santos Escobar being a possible potential world champion in the future if they keep up this momentum that Santos Escobar has got going on right now. Then the next match we saw was for the women's world title. With oh, uh, did I did I not give a match rating for Santos Escobar and Dragon Lee? I'll give this match a rating of a three out of a five. Then the next match, as I said before, I gave y'all my match rating for that match with Dragon Lee and Santos Escobar was Rhea Ripley versus Zoe Starks. Now. This was Zoe Stark's first match on the scene as a main roster competitor. And I'm talking about a one-on-one match because at Crown Jewel, she was a part of the five-way match for the Women's World title. And she earned herself the number one contender spot on the episode of Monday Night Raw to challenge Rhea Ripley for the Women's World title at Survivor Series. And this match was decent. I'll give this match a rating of a 3 out of a 5. Rhea Ripley, as expected, got the win, successfully defend- defending her Women's World title. I'll give this match a rating of a two and a half out of a five. It could have been better. And I'm sure if they had more time, they could have produced a better match. But it is what it is. Zoe Starks put up a good fight for what it was. And it had decent back and forthness and decent pace throughout the match. And both wrestlers can go. That's why I said they could have put on a better match if they had more time. And as I said, this was a decent match and it was more of a time filler match. And that's how decent matches usually tend to fill. And that's what this match was. And the next match was the main event. That being the Mayo War Games match featuring the Judgment Day and the team of Cody Rhodes, Jay Uso, and Sami Zayn, and Seth Rollins, and Randy Orton. And prior to this match, Team Cody Rhodes was questioning Cody Rhodes and... His mentor, you can sort of say, Randy Orton, who was a no-show prior to this match, who was announced on the episode of Raw to be the fifth member to help out Team Cody Rhodes versus Judgment Day at Survivor Series' main event. They were saying, where's Randy Orton? And Randy Orton came out when... The Judgment Day had the rest of Team Cody Rhodes beat down and out. And Rhea Ripley came out when Randy Orton no-showed when the fifth member, who was Randy Orton, was supposed to come out. And he didn't make the entrance with the rest of Team Cody Rhodes at the beginning of this match. And when the fifth member was supposed to show... For Team Cody Rhodes, he didn't come out. Hence why Rhea Ripley's music hit. And she ran out with Damian Priest's Money in the Bank contract. For Damian Priest to cash in his Money in the Bank contract. For Damian Priest to become the new World Heavyweight Champion. And then as Rhea Ripley was telling the ring announcer to announce... Damien Priest is cashing, then that's when Randy Orton's music hit and Randy Orton came out and the War Games match officially began. And the match itself was good quality. I would say y'all go check it out whenever y'all have the chance to. And Randy Orton had a moment with Jey Uso. Remember, before Randy Orton... 
made his return at Survivor Series this past Saturday, he was put on the injury list when the bloodline took him out. And Randy Orton showed his animosity towards Jey Uso for Jey Uso's involvement with the bloodline at taking out Randy Orton. But because they was taking on the Judgment Day in the same team in this match, they couldn't go at it with each other. And when, I don't know who it was, was it, it could, it could have been any member of the Judgment Day ran at both Jey Uso and Randy Orton. Jey Uso intercepted that member of the Judgment Day with a super kick who was trying to take both of them out when they was having a face-off. And a cool spot that was featured in this match was when all five members of Team Cody Rhodes hit that Randy Orton signature DDT on each member of the Judgment Day. And how... Team Cody Rhodes got the win was when Cody Rhodes hit the crossroads on Damian Priest to get the win for his team. And I'll give this match a rating of a three and a half out of a five. And there were enough highlight row spots that was featured. Throughout this match, I'm not going to list all the highlight row spots that was featured in this match. There wasn't a lot of them. And I know that can be a surprise to many people because War Games is gimmicked to be a hardcore match. And as I said, there wasn't a lot of them. And the only hardcore highlight row spot that I can remember was when J.D. McDonough got caught trying to make an escape when the rest of the Judgment Day members was down and out. And he got intercepted when he was at the top of the cage by Sami Zayn and Seth Rollins. And both of them threw J.D. McDonough from the top of the cage. And Randy Orton caught J.D. McDonald in midair and hit him with the RKO. And that was the only hardcore highlight reel spot that was featured in this match that was worthy of mentioning. Uh, and, and Randy Orton wasn't the only wrestler to make a return on the scene for the WWE as Survivor Series because as the winners was celebrating their victory, CM Punk's music hit, who was rumored to make his return to the WWE in his hometown of Chicago, where Survivor Series was being hosted this past Saturday. Now, I didn't hear any wrestling sites and talks from wrestling fans of spotting CM Punk at Survivor Series before he made his entrance to officially stamp his return to the WWE. I didn't hear any contractual talks of CM Punk and the WWE. That's why there was no spoilers for CM Punk's return to the WWE, it sounded like wishful thinking from wrestling fans. And it was more based on hope that CM Punk would make his return to the WWE as Survivor Series. Now, it was a surprise for me because of how quick CM Punk returned to the WWE after him re-signing with AEW, after he left AEW last year 
after what happened with him and A Steel and the Elite, and then he re-signed with AEW earlier this year when AEW came out with their show Collision, and CM Punk was a big part of AEW Collision when that show debuted, and then CM Punk and his contract with AEW terminated after what happened at All In. And that was the final straw with CM Punk and AEW's venture of working together. And that's only, what, three months that CM Punk and AEW parted ways? And CM Punk, it's been almost a decade since we saw CM Punk with the WWE and the way CM Punk parted ways with the WWE was definitely not professional and his reputation of him not being able to coexist with those that work around him that's what ultimately led to his demise with AEW and their partnership and for the WWE to know that fact and have an experience of CM Punk and his reputation and his lack of ability well, I'm not going to say lack of ability because he doesn't take any BS from those that work around him. And he is a stand-up guy when it comes to him not taking any BS and him not being taken advantage of. And him not letting those that work around him get any leverage when it comes to making him do stuff that he doesn't want to do. And I think that is a good aspect and a good character. However, it can be frustrating for those that depend on him to perform out there. And that's why this move was a surprise for me because of how quick the WWE was willing to work with CM Punk after what had took place with him in AEW. And that can be considered by many people as unprofessional and inconsiderable. And the WWE, that goes to show y'all as far as they go with their works that they're willing to put all that burden aside to make things work for their company. And this was a good move for both parties because CM Punk, him being away for almost a decade with the WWE, has got to be a rejuvenating feel for CM Punk. And this also brings attention to the WWE and that's because CM Punk is a well recognized name that is synonymous with pro wrestling because of his other ventures with him having fought in the UFC before and when he had dropped a pipe bomb in 2011, that was a revolutionizing moment in pro wrestling. And that stamped CM Punk as one of the most charismatic and outspoken figures in pro wrestling. And this gives a rejuvenating feel for all of pro wrestling fans and has the public wanting to take interest in the WWE and what they got going on. And there's many possible good feuds that we can see produced out of CM Punk's return 
with the WWE. All I can say is I'm looking forward to CM Punk's second run in the WWE. And as far as Survivor Series goes, I will give this year's Survivor Series a rating of a 8 out of a 10. It was a very well put together show. And the wrestling that was produced for Survivor Series was a good one. And with that being said, that does it for this episode of Talk Wrestling. I want y'all to go click the links in the description to show y'all support for this channel. Anything would be appreciated. And I want y'all to comment y'all opinions from both Full Gear and Survivor Series. And as well as subscribe, like, and share, and all that all good stuff. And I'm out of here, y'all. Peace.